Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin.
Unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptation to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man came to save the lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, Truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about, every, about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. confess our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead 
and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our hymn of the day.
from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, thank you for the opportunity to be with you as we gather around our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Pastor Stork, for inviting me to preach the gospel this morning. I'm honored to be here. I bring you greetings from the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, the Office of International Missions, and from our partner church in Sri Lanka, the Ceylon Evangelical Lutheran Church. Last month, the Synod in Convention uh, voted to recognize the Ceylon Evangelical Lutheran Church as an independent church body with whom we are an altar and pulpit fellowship with. And you, our brothers and sisters in Christ, a good shepherd, are near and dear to our hearts. You have partnered with us uh, from early on, and we thank you for your prayers over these years. The Lord hears and answers them. Your partnership with us uh, is, is uh, very meaningful, uh, especially uh, we are encouraged as we serve overseas and deal with the many different issues that come up. So I thank you for your financial contributions to God's mission work in Sri Lanka, as well as your prayers. For you're not simply patrons, but you are participating in his mission work in Sri Lanka. So thank you. Six years ago, my family and I moved to Sri Lanka, off the, which is off the southern tip of India. Sri Lanka is an independent island nation about 550 miles north of the equator. And the climate is uh, uh, definitely tropical. Uh, the recent heat wave you experienced this summer is normal there, except with much higher humidity. And so in that tropical environment, we have two seasons, hot and hotter. Now that heat and humidity does not appeal to most, but I've grown to love it. In fact, I've been cold almost every day I've been back in the States, even in that heat wave. I'm looking forward to returning to the climate in, a, well, in about nine days from now. But far more important than the climate, I am looking forward to returning to serve the people of our partner church uh, in reaching out, teaching about the kingdom of heaven, and teaching how Jesus brings us into the kingdom of heaven. Our reading begins with the disciples asking Jesus a question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, it's natural that people talk about who's the greatest or what's the greatest. I mean, football fans may argue who's the greatest quarterback. Film buffs may argue about what is the greatest film. Historians may argue who is the greatest president? And these arguments uh, usually surround, or many factors are usually brought up in these arguments, with which people give reasons why this person or that thing is greater or the greatest. So it's no surprise that the disciples would ask, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now they could have been sitting there arguing about whether it was Elijah or Moses, David or Isaiah. That's probably not exactly what they were thinking. Jesus had all along been proclaiming, the kingdom of heaven is near. And before our reading, Jesus told them that they would see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus had set apart 12 of his disciples, and in just the previous chapter, Jesus selected three of them, Peter, James, and John, to come with him on the mountain where he transfigured and spoke to Moses and Elijah. And so the disciples were thinking about themselves. Which of us are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It's like a player asking the coach, who's the greatest player on the team, coach? Who's the MVP? Who is doing it all right? Who is it that should be emulated? Who should everyone strive to be like so that they can be called great? We do this kind of thing in the church. Some people might talk about, well, who's the greatest Christian? Is it Martin Luther? Billy Graham? Walter Meyer? Matthew Harrison? Who's the greatest congregational member? Is it your pastor? Is it that wonderful woman who faithfully attends every Sunday, comes to every Bible study, uh, 
serves in women's groups, teaches Sunday school, visits nursing homes, and writes cards and notes to other members. Who's the greatest pastor? Is it the one who grew the church the most? The one who children liked the most? The one who told the best jokes during the sermon? The one who faithfully ministered to you when your spouse fell ill and died? So who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Is it you? If not, why not? I mean, you must be great if you're not the greatest, right? Are you at least pretty good? What is the truth? Personally, on the last day, I'd love Jesus to say, Stephen, you did well. Instead of seeking a life of wealth and luxury, you became a pastor and a missionary. You left your home, family, friends, country to proclaim the gospel in Sri Lanka. You teach people God's word. You raised your children well. You helped those in need. I see all that you did. Well, well done, good and faithful servant. You did great. Don't we all want Jesus to look at our lives and say, we did great? Don't we want Jesus to say that the, you did the best you possibly could considering the circumstances of your life? See all that you did. Well done, good and faithful servants. You did great. Jesus' response to his disciples' question speaks to our own desires to be told we did great. Calling to him a child, Jesus put him in the midst of the disciples and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And whoever humbles himself like this child will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Unless you turn and be like children. You'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. If you humble yourself like this child, you will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? What does it mean to turn uh, and become like a little child, like children? What does it mean to humble yourself like a child? When adults act childish all the time. People even wear shirts declaring, I refuse to grow up. And many long for the days of childhood when they lacked responsibilities and were unencumbered by the cares and concerns of adulthood. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus was talking about something far more scandalous. This young child that Jesus picked up and placed physically placed in their midst, would never be considered the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, at least by our standards. I mean, what had he done? What great accomplishment had he made? How many people had he converted? This little kid was completely dependent on others. He needed someone to provide him food, clothing, shelter, to care for him in illness and injury, he was subject to the wills of others. Even Jesus, who physically put him in the midst of the disciples. His child was helpless and utterly dependent, especially on his parents. And without someone to take care of him, he would die. And he could do nothing in return. He couldn't work to eat it. Earn his keep. He couldn't take care of the house, wash dishes, or make dinner. He couldn't get a job, mow the lawn, or even bring in the mail. He could make no contribution to his own well being. Basically, he had to sponge off his parents and others. And this is the scandal. Jesus is teaching that if you cannot, you cannot even enter the kingdom of heaven unless you recognize that you are utterly and totally dependent upon God. You cannot be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven unless you can't contribute, but only sponge off Jesus. What about all the 
many hours I volunteered? Nope. About how often I attended church? Nope. What about all the money? Don't even go there. Once we realize that we are utterly and totally dependent on God and His mercy, the issue of the greatest becomes meaningless. Once we understand that we are basically freeloaders sponging off Jesus for forgiveness, life, and salvation, we will see that there is no greater position to be in than to be receiving the charity of God in Jesus. There's no other choice. And that's why we come here. That's why we are in church. That's why we listen to God's word and, and receive his sacrament. We gather here not to give something to God or demonstrate our own greatness, but to receive grace and mercy from God because we so desperately need it each and every day. So we repent of our sins, of our sinful way of thinking. And this way we humble ourselves before God, admitting that he's right. We have nothing to offer but are in desperate need of his forgiveness, his righteousness, his life, his mercy. And on account of Jesus, he gives this all to you without price to you, but freely on account of Jesus' life, on account of Jesus' death, on account of Jesus' resurrection. As any good parent caring for their child, God pays the price for you, your life and your well-being. This past May, I held little baby Arvin Raphael in my arms. He was born to BJ Kumar and Renita. Arvin Raphael was only a few weeks old, and all he could do was eat, sleep, dirty his diaper, and cry. This child was utterly and completely dependent on his parents. But that morning we recognized that truly he was utterly and completely dependent upon his heavenly father, as we all are. We stood there barefoot as is the custom in the humid 90 degree heat of Colombo. In that church, all Arvin Raphael could do was to be held as I poured water on his head declared, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. There he received the loving gifts Jesus earned for him. There we are all reminded of why we are here. <laughs> like that child, Arvin Raphael. That we are in need of God to take care of us of our Heavenly Father to watch over us and provide us for all that we need, not only in this body and life, but in eternity. This is why we are reminded of why, uh, this is why God sends out missionaries around the world. We are all in need of Jesus. Without Him, we will die. God freely gives us Jesus. And so gives us forgiveness and life. Salvation. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We rise to join in the singing of the offering.
knowing that our Lord has promised to be in our midst, wherever two or three are gathered in his name, let us bring our prayers and supplications before him. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord, have mercy. For pastors, that is God's watchmen, they may be faithful in calling sinners to repentance and joyfully announcing the Lord's forgiveness to those who heed their warning. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the Mulberts and for all of the missionaries and their families, as they continue to share the gospel both near and far, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful, that each of us may serve as our brother's keeper, both in our earthly families and among our brothers and sisters in Christ, and that we may owe no one anything except to love each other. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our leaders, that they would bear the sword righteously, and for all who protect us, especially our armed forces, police, and firefighters, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the ill, the grieving, and lonely, especially for the family and friends of Holly Castler, Jeff Denty, and Ethel Boss. For the for Peggy, for Paula, for Jonathan, Kathy, Larry, Jennifer, Fred, Vic, Gary, Vicky, Declan, Richard, Vera, Eric, Deb, Dan, Mike, and Jessica, that they may remember that the good shepherd who loves them seeks and saves the one lost sheep. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For childlike faith as we receive Christ's body and blood, that it may strengthen us in faith toward God and in fervent love toward one another, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all of God's little ones, that they would not perish but be called back to him when tempted to stray, delivered from temptation and kept in the faith. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who, having created all things, took on human flesh, and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake he died on the cross, and rose from the dead to put an end to death thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore praising you and saying
give it free. Depart now in peace and joy. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Thank you. 
of the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh. We thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Thank you, first off, for Pastor Mulberg and for the words of law and gospel, for the words of grace that you have brought us today. It's always wonderful as a pastor. I'm sure when you get to come back to the States, you oftentimes get 
asked to preach as well as being back in Sri Lanka as well, but I do have to tell you I appreciate being able to get to sit and, and listen to preaching and thank you very much not only um, for that word for myself but also for the saints here at Good Shepherd. So God bless you for that and thank you for your assistance this morning. Just a couple of other announcements. I'm not going to keep it long today. Please come and join us just in a couple of minutes downstairs in the parish hall. Um, Pastor Malberg and his family are going to be making a presentation about the work that they are currently doing in Sri Lanka um, as they share the gospel with those there. Um, and we can hear about the work that they are doing and also continue to hear about how we might be able to, as a congregation and as individuals, be able to continue to support them um, in the work that they are doing there by bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So please come and join us for that. And of course, after the presentation is done, we're going to have a small luncheon as well. So if you're thinking, oh, my tummy's going to start getting hungry and, you know, maybe it's better for me just to go. No, stay put. There will be food to eat. You know, we can't do anything here at Good Shepherd without having at least some food. So please come and stay this morning, if not for my sake or Pastor Malberg's sake or just for the sake of the gospel or for the sake of your stomach. Okay? Uh, also a reminder, we continue to make our way through the book of Revelation on Thursdays. We have finally reached the last two chapters. So if you're thinking, oh, I still want to catch up to Revelation and want to be able to get into it on the ground floor. Well, you still can do that. We've got two chapters to go. Maybe we'll be done before 2024. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? We'll, we'll see what God has in store. So please, if you've got time this coming Thursday, join us at noon um, as we continue to make our way through the book of Revelation. Christ is risen! He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah.